Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High. Learn the story behind the handmade bath bombs of Firefly Apothecary in Grandview. We are a day program with individuals with developmental disabilities. A contemporary jewelry exhibit in Delaware will leave you feeling très belle. And the Goldsberries join us in the studio to share their unique blend of bluegrass and folk music. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Our first story tonight takes us to Grandview and a visit to Firefly Apothecary. It's a retail store that provides meaningful job opportunities for individuals with developmental disabilities. In addition to learning valuable job skills, they are making some bath and beauty products that are, quite frankly, the bomb. This is Firefly Apothecary in Grandview Heights, Ohio. We are a day program with individuals with developmental disabilities. So we make a wide variety of bath products, bath bombs, sugar scrubs, um, soaking salts. We also have little things like candles, um, soap, conditioner, shampoo, and bars of soap as well. So today we're gonna to be making a bath bomb. So it's an all-natural product, our bath bombs are. Um, it consists of baking soda, citric acid, um, cornstarch, Epsom salt. You gotta make sure all the salt is matched up. There you go. Four cups of salt. The um, moisturizing agents that we put in there, which is sunflower oil, coconut oil, and shea butter. A bath bomb is pretty simple to use. You know, you just draw your bath, um, you, you throw it in the bath with you, it fizzes, you get a nice smell with it, whichever scent that you choose. A lot of people love um, the scents that we have. Everyone's favorite is coconut lime, and it just leaves your skin feeling nice and smooth. So these are bath bombs. I test in my bathtub all the time. It's very calming if you need, like, to relax and like you've just had like a stressful day. So you'll see all the individuals work together in a big group setting. They're learning different skills, they're learning recipes, they're learning how to work with um, their peers every day um, and how to take this into a job further down the road. Lisa is one of our individuals here. She was the first one to start when we opened in April. Um, so she came up with the idea of having a cupcake bath bomb. She has made all of them herself. It has icing and sprinkles on top of it. It's just a really fun idea for her to create her own. So we are actually a profit sharing organization. So any profit that we make here in the store goes back to the individuals. So they're learning how to work in a retail store. They're learning social skills and how to interact with the community when people come in and buy the products, as long as learning how to make bath bombs and having a good um, work ethic. Um, my name is Susie May Cowes. I'm from Harriard, Ohio. I like working here because um, I like making bath bomb and making last stuff. Outside of the apothecary, Firefly also um, provides support services which is just in-home care to individuals with developmental disabilities. The individuals here um, all come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, each one of them are unique in their own ways. And I think the main thing I would want to tell people is when you come in here and you buy a product, you support these individuals and their dreams that they might have.
Firefly Apothecary is open Monday through Saturday. Learn more about the vocational services they offer and explore their full line of bath and beauty products by checking out their Facebook page. Next, we're headed up to Delaware to check out the latest exhibit at the Ross Art Museum on Ohio Wesleyan's campus. Bijou Contemporain features the work of 13 jewelers from French-speaking countries in Canada and Europe. We got to explore the exhibit to see how these artists reimagine the way art and adornment collide, and also how some college students got to play an active role in the installation. So we're at the Ross Art Museum, which is on the main street in Delaware, Ohio, right off Sandusky. If you walk into this museum, what you're about to see is a fabulous exhibit of contemporary jewelry. But the twist here is that it's contemporary francophone jewelry. So it's done by jewelers who speak French or work in French-speaking countries in Canada or in Europe. Most people don't understand what contemporary jewelry is about. Uh, there's the jewelry that you buy in a store, but then there's the jewelry, usually called studio jewelry or art jewelry, which you only find in a gallery. But it's artwork that is more closely aligned to sculpture, to fine art, and to contemporary art than it is aligned with traditional jewelry. This is an artist by the name of Sophie Hanagarth, who's very famous and is French. Um, Hannah Garth is interesting because she's working frequently with materials not associated with jewelry. So you'll see that four of the five, six pieces on here are actually made out of iron, which is very heavy. And she is conceptually very strong because she's thinking about the way that the jewelry both interacts with and reflects the body. These two bracelets um, are from a series called The Intimate Life of Worms. So when we think of worms, many of us will have a very visceral reaction, like a woo reaction. But imagine then that you have to put this on your hand and wear it. So she's interested in those types of interactions. Um, these are called lipsticks. So you can see again that you have the form of the lips here. And then the lips either have to engulf your finger going on, or you basically stick through the lips as if you were a tongue coming this way. So she says these things are meant to reactivate our sense of ourselves and our body, um, and to think about those bodies in different ways. This work is by an artist um, named Gabrielle Desmarais, who will actually be joining us for a workshop at the school. Um, she is a Quebecois artist who is thinking a lot about what she calls um, works that are worn by battle. So it's not that they've actually been in battle, but that she's thinking about accumulated debris that are brought together in such a way that it gives the effect that they're battle-worn. One of the things that's so special about Des Marais is that they have, again, a lot of secrets to them. So this is a brooch that would face the viewers in such a way, but on the side, you can see that it's wrapped with all of these beautiful little stones and the thread. And then there are pieces like this, where all you see is this flat, dull, patinaed metal um, and only the wearer would know about the Labradorite in the back. And that's kind of um, a secret that you're actually wearing. I like, I like when you can have a jewelry that have um, beautiful spots from all around. So the Ross Art Museum is here actually to serve campus and community. And jewelry is one of those things that's so universal. People love it, we're drawn to it. but. It's also an opportunity to connect deeply with classes, which as an academic art gallery, we're fully committed to doing. And I realized that we at the university have a small medals program where students learn to make jewelry. And we also have a modern foreign languages department where students learn to speak French. And I thought, what if we could combine these things together with a small international exhibit where students could also interact with the French translations and or thinking about how the jewelry is made. Gabrielle is from Montreal. She's one of 13 artists who are in this exhibition, Bijoux Contemporain, 
So today was about playing and finding new shapes and new designs. So we've been using leaves and using old rusty parts and old uh, paper and threads and then seeing how they could actually work with the resin and how they could build up and be preserved into that plastic element. I like to think of that resin piece like a precious stone that we can actually set later on in silver or gold and create a new jewelry. We've written overview labels for each case so people can learn a little bit about the artist's background, who they are, why they do what they do, and the students did research for the overview texts that the French students then translated. So they did some of the background research on the artists um, and really drawing on like that depth of experience that they get from the classes here to help us flesh out the content of the exhibit. Everybody in these classes typically is a major or minor, so they're very interested and motivated in perfecting their French in terms of language skills. Each student took two artists and translated the biography. Translation is different than reading and writing responses in kind of the way that you have to be focused on what the message is most importantly knowing when to use one word over the other in English or in French, that's where it really comes down to being more of a fine art. And when you look at the labels at the exhibit, they're not, it's not simple language. So to have a fourth semester class doing this, I think they deservedly feel very proud. So even though you're seeing these objects in cases in the museum, these works are essentially meant to be worn. We show them here in the museum so you can get a sense of the craft and so you can understand more about each of the artists. But I think it's important to say that they're living, breathing, working artists as well. Bijou Contemporain is on view at the Ross Art Museum in Delaware through February 9th, 2020. Visit them online or check out their Facebook page for times and details. Our local music series continues tonight with a performance by the Goldsberries. They describe their music as folk grass jam, an acoustic sound inspired by old time bluegrass and folk music. Here they are in the WOSU studio performing their original song, Lonely Abyss. Made a lot of money, burned a hole in my pocket. I had a bunch of honey and I pissed it down the drain. Said you'd come see me, but now it's a morning. And I'm standing in the back door and the landscape looks the same. Oh, honey, you said you'd meet me at midnight. But I'm still waiting for that kiss. I stand at the back door looking over. Fishing. Gotta try a new hobby. I had a scratch and itch and I toppled out the boat. And I went dirty, put my clothes on the line. Standing in the breezeway, thinking about what Joel's was. Oh, honey, you said you'd meet me at midnight. But I'm still waiting for that kiss. I stand at the back door looking over. In the morning, I'll go in slow. Perhaps I will show up. I wonder if they'll know. Stay home, write a poem, search for a way. Figure out if you're leaving, then I'll beg you to stay. Oh, honey, you said you'd meet me at midnight. Well, I'm 
still waiting for that kiss. I stand at the back door looking over one big lonely abyss. I said, honey, won't you meet me at midnight? But I'm still waiting for that kiss. I stand at the back door looking over one big You can find more videos from the Goldsberries and their visit to the WOSU studios by going to wosu.org slash local tunes. Meanwhile, check out the band's Facebook page to see where you can catch them live in concert. And finally tonight, a visit to the Hudson River Skywalk in the Catskill Mountains of New York. The Skywalk is a pedestrian path that connects the historic homes of Thomas Cole and Frederick Church, two famous Hudson River School painters. Our friends at WMHT-PBS in Troy, New York, bring us this story about an area that inspired some of America's greatest landscape artists. Thomas Cole was the founder of an art movement that we now know as the Hudson River School, which was the first major art movement in America. And it started with Thomas Cole in about 1825, when he was just 24 years old and extended into the late 19th century. So it dominated American visual culture for over 50 years. Olana is one of the most magnificent places in the country. Uh, it's uh, Frederick Church's home and studio and 250 acre designed historic landscape. Frederick Church was a founding figure of American art. His mentor was Thomas Cole. What we've done with this project is we've taken the two founders of the Hudson River School and connected them. The Hudson River Skywalk is a, a literal connection, a trail that uh, you can walk on. It's three miles one way, six miles, a really good workout if you do a round trip. It's this true connection and trail that is open to the public now for their enjoyment. The connection of these two sites is so fantastic because they've been linked by history and they've been linked by themes and by stories and Thomas Cole when he was in his 40s had this young student Frederick Church who was still a teenager and he took him over to the place where Church would later build Olana and showed him this magnificent landscape. And so these two places have been intertwined throughout the centuries and now people can think of them in the same breath, they can visit them in the same day, they can walk between them. The Hudson River Skywalk concept began in 2015 when uh, Olana and the Thomas Cole site had a collaborative exhibition uh, called River Crossings Contemporary Art Comes Home. And we were celebrating the opening of that uh, exhibition. The Bridge Authority folks were invited and present. These two artists are on opposite sides of the river, only divided by uh, our bridge. This bridge is really a tourism asset and should be promoted as such. It had a walkway on it, although a walkway to nowhere. You couldn't go anywhere once you got to the other side, but nonetheless, a spectacular experience. It was at that moment that the people in the room who had, you know, hatched the whole idea of river crossings began to see that this could be the future. Of, um, of a new combined destination. Many partners came together understanding that it's art and art history, that we have a historic treasure right here. That's what motivated us all to get together and work for two, three years. It, it was an uphill challenge because on the Olana side of the bridge, it's a very busy intersection with lots of highways coming in in all directions. And we talked about it for a long time. How would we get people 
over this busy intersection? What could we do? We talked about a bridge or a tunnel. It became a beautiful park with a circle and crosswalks, benches, a sitting wall. It just, it, instead of a place that you zoom through, it became a destination to stop and appreciate the beauty that was there. The public can come and walk across the Hudson River Skywalk, experiencing the three-dimensional versions of the paintings of the Hudson River School. It's also a significant new economic engine for our region. The goal is to really create a new tourist destination that will be nationally known, if not internationally known, that will draw people from around the world and around the country to this region. And this region we're defining as the city of Hudson, Alana, across the bridge to the Thomas Cole site, and then to the village of Catskill. So the Skywalk is really a great thing in the sense that it builds on that infrastructure to create connection between peoples and culture and history. The Hudson River School is a loose affiliation of artists as well as the writers that inspired them that had a thought that they shared, which was that these landscapes here are national treasures and that the beauty that, and the nature that we see all around us in this country was something that we should celebrate and something that could be lost. They shared this belief also that by being in nature, it was a healing experience. It was something that we as a country should experience more and it, and it could cause our spirits to be lifted, it could cause a, a moral uplift in the citizens of the United States, and it was something to be proud of as a country. I think what's so exciting about what's happening now is that we've heard it, we've heard this message, and we do realize that this is precious and that it's ephemeral and it's easy to lose. So projects like this, the Hudson River Skywalk, brings attention to the fact that this is here, it is still available to us by the efforts of so many people, Scenic Hudson, New York State, Alana, Thomas Cole, so many people have worked on making sure that this beauty is still here, and this is an opportunity. It's a giant platform to appreciate it from. Well, that's our show. You can find all of our stories at WOSU.org or on our free WOSU public media mobile app. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing out the show today with more music by the Goldsberries. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here next week. Do you think of me in the moonlight when all the stars are shining bright? Crickets are chirping the sea And I think of you, do you think of me? Here at the Ohio History Center, I'm with Emmy Beach, and she's going to tell us a little bit about their dangerous collections. We have a really uh, fun collection that I always like to point visitors to. It is glassware that has trace amounts of uranium in it. And this was popular primarily in the 1920s and the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Production on it completely stopped during World War II. Uranium was really tightly regulated of during course. that time. And Kate, if you want to see some of these uranium glass pieces that we have in our collection here at the Ohio History Center, we can go and take a look. Let's do it, I love it. Cool. All right, Kate, so there's a couple pieces of uranium glass in our collection here. Okay. And I brought a special little tool with me. Ooh. One of the cool things about uranium glass is that it glows under a black light. The, the chemistry of the uranium is what makes it glow, not radiation. Okay, so I really, really enjoyed the uranium glass. Do you have other dangerous collections we happening? We do. They're kind of scattered throughout the Ohio History Center, but you know, when to come with me, we'll take a look. Let's do it. Awesome.
All right, Emmy, I see you brought us to the World War I gallery, and I'm curious as to what our friend has here and what might be dangerous about it. Oh, sure. Well, I'm here with Andrew Hall. He's here holding one of our World War I helmets. Um, asbestos was used widely during World War I when they were making these helmets. You'll find asbestos specifically wow. in uh, the filter of these gas masks. So this part right here. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So, so they were breathing asbestos. Essentially, but you know, in the moment, they were protecting themselves from things like mustard gas, sure. which you know uh, was thought so to be priority a higher time, priority. Yeah. All right, so this gas mask was spooky, definitely dangerous. Do you have more to show us on the in the dangerous collections? Yeah, we got one more thing to show you. It should be really fun. So we are in the natural history area, and we're looking at, as you can see, a lot of taxidermied animals. And uh, what's dangerous about these collections is that they're all, many of them, are preserved with arsenic. My favorite piece, and one of the most eye-catching pieces, is this Victorian fire screen. It would have been placed in front of the fireplace of a Victorian household during the summer months to kind of hide that area and, and make the room look a little more decorative. Well, this is fascinating. Thank you so much for educating me about this dangerous collection. Absolutely. It's been an exciting day. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you. Thank you.